you know, it's not like Steve sat around in his garage and invented the iPod. He didn't, right? But what Steve was phenomenal about doing is, uh, and was so, which was so rare, right, was that most of us operate with either a telescope, a long range lens, or we operate with a microscope, a short range lens, right? So most of us are either good at big picture things or we're good at micro tasks, right? And somewhere in between. It's very rare that you meet someone that can have long range telescope strategic vision, but they can pull it back down and get granular enough to pick the color of the first iMac. And if a coder is having a problem writing the core operating system, be able to sit down, roll up your sleeves and actually help that engineer code. And that was Steve Jobs. It's time! Work! Play! Evolve! I want to connect the listeners to the best of the best Welcome to the Evolved Broker Podcast. I'm your host, Pat Costello, the co-founder and principal at Evolve MGA. Our mission for the podcast is to bring the insurance industry the best of the best. My guest today is the CEO of one of the fastest growing wealth management 401k firms in the US. His name is John Porter. Three years ago, Forbes and RIA Channel recognized his firm, Three Bell Capital, as the number one emerging wealth management firm in the country. In 2020, they named Three Bell one of the top 100 firms in the US. Financial Times named them a top 300 firm for the last two years running, which puts them in the top 1% of all wealth management firms nationwide. John is a graduate of Santa Clara Law School, magna cum laude, and prior to Three Bell, he worked closely with Steve Jobs on Apple's legal team. Three Bell Capital has served as an enormous referral source for personal lines agents, commercial lines agents, and can help your agency dramatically expand the value proposition for your clients. John and I discussed what it was like to work with Steve Jobs, philosophies for growing Three Bell Capital, the story of Three Bell almost getting hacked and dealing with the SEC, and finally, Three Bell's intersection with the insurance industry. Without further ado, here's John. John. Welcome to the Evolved Broker Podcast. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Great to have you. <laughs> I'm really glad we could do it. I would like to start out by talking about your time with Apple and your exposure to the legendary Steve Jobs. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was an interesting time. So when I got to Apple, it was uh, circa 2001. Okay. And so if you set the way back clock, that was uh, shortly after Steve had returned to the company, uh, put out the first iMac. Okay. Uh, and the quarter I got there, they announced the first iPod uh, with, you know, a thousand songs in your pocket. Um, and so at the time, nobody really knew that that was going to revolutionize the company or be what it was. Um, but when I got there, the company had about 5,000 employees and it was very clearly struggling and it was very clearly an acquisition target. And what team were you placed on? What role did you have? So I was uh, an attorney there and I supported predominantly the operations team negotiating um, supply chain agreements with uh, the folks that manufactured things like the hard drives, okay. um, software agreements with uh, partners like Adobe. Uh, and then occasionally uh, there would be projects or companies that we'd be working with or, or solutions that we needed uh, where it didn't make sense to license them, uh, either because it was going to be too expensive or we couldn't engineer around the patents. And uh, in that case, I would facilitate acquisition of those companies. Okay. Yep. Cool. Yep. And I know you told me this off camera, but you have one of the funniest stories about meeting Steve Jobs for the first time. Can you talk about the first day that you met Steve Jobs? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So uh, once again, when it was a smaller company, um, they used to do some really fun things uh, through a huge holiday party, um, one of the things that they did was everybody dressed up for Halloween. And this, the dynamic was such that if you didn't dress up for Halloween, you were like a pariah. Like people made fun of you, stone you, throw tomatoes, stuff like that. Um, but uh, I was dressed up that year. Uh, the movie Zoolander had just come out. Of course. Uh, classic. Um, uh, I shouldn't even be talking about it right now because it's not ready. Uh, <laughs> but I dressed up as Hansel. Uh, who's played by Owen Wilson, and my, my buddy, Eric, uh, dressed up as Zoolander. 
And so the, the costumes made a ton of sense when they were together. Um, but when we were apart, right, you know, I had a, a long blonde wig on and a flowing kind of robe and it, it basically just looked like I was in drag. <laughs> were you riding a razor scooter too? I did. I did have a razor scooter. Love uh, that touch. Um, I did have a razor scooter. Um, but uh, it was parked at the time uh, that this story occurred. But I was, uh, I was seated outside um, the little cafeteria area and it was right at lunchtime, so it was packed. And I was seated at a table that had two other seats uh, available at it. So it sort of, I was sitting solo and out comes Steve from the main entrance. Um, and he's kind of walking out with his tray and he's looking left and right for a place to sit. And there's really obviously no place to sit, but at my table. Mm -hmm. Real quick, was yeah. he wearing his classic oh, yeah. uh, oh, black yeah. turtleneck or no costume though? No, no costume. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think he went to Steve Jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually you just get to go as yourself. Got it. Uh, mm -hmm. Something to strive for. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, he's walking out in his classic mock, mock turtleneck uh, and jeans and sees me at my table with an empty seat. And he kind of makes eye contact. And, you know, of course you invite your CEO to sit down and it looks like they need a place to sit. And uh, so he sits down and immediately I'm keenly aware of the fact that uh, I'm in a Hansel uh, costume and he probably has no idea uh, who that character is. And so there's an awkward moment of silence and he says, so, uh, so what are you supposed to be? And I, uh, I try to explain Zoolander and who Hansel is and there's another awkward moment of silence. And uh, if I finally just say, well, chances that you meet your CEO for the first time while dressed in drag, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> and without missing a beat, he looks at me and says, it was a gutsy call, man. It was a gutsy call. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what, was, what was really interesting was that really was the first time I met him. Um, and then throughout my career at Apple, which spanned about five years, um, I got to interact with him a lot, worked with him on a number of different projects. And so I had, a, um, as, as most people, um, compared to most people at the company, I had a, a relatively um, close relationship with him. So on that note, what was it like to work with Steve Jobs? Interesting. Um, he, he certainly deserves, you know, every accolade that he's ever received. Um, and he's iconic for a reason. Um, he would be the first person to tell you that he had a great cast of characters around him. Um, you know, it's not like Steve sat around in his garage and invented the iPod. He didn't, right? But what Steve was phenomenal about doing is, uh, and was so, which was so rare, right, was that most of us operate with either a telescope, a long range lens, or we operate with a microscope, a short range lens, right? So most of us are either good at big picture things or we're good at micro tasks, right? And somewhere in between. It's very rare that you meet someone that can have long range telescope strategic vision, but they can pull it back down and get granular enough to pick the color of the first iMac. And if a coder is having a problem writing the core operating system, be able to sit down, roll up your sleeves and actually help that engineer code. And that was Steve Jobs. He could do both. He could do both. And that, that was sort of the, what was, that more than anything else was what, was, what made him so, so much of a genius, right? Uh -huh. uh, I think he was also an, uh, just a consummate perfectionist, right? And he was not going to settle for anything less than what his vision of perfection was. And so he was that guy that drove you harder and was sometimes brutal um, with his feedback um, but he drove everyone around him to produce their best. Um, and so it was sometimes challenging uh, to be around him, um, but it was also an honor. And it, there are definitely things that I took from my experiences with him that you know I've tried to apply at Three Bell. Very cool. I've heard a lot of stories about interesting quirks that he had, you know, for, like, for example, not wearing shoes at certain times or... Um, you know, saying, or just walking into meetings at random. Yeah. Is there any quirks that you can tell us about from working with him? Yeah, I mean, his, so the ones that you, one of them you already mentioned, he almost always wore the same thing, right? The black turtleneck. The, yeah, black turtleneck or a black shirt and jeans. And maybe you got Birkenstocks, but, you know, he was comfortable. He was sort of a man of the people. And so, you know, even when he did his town halls and he did, um, you know, internal employee Apple meetings, he wasn't dressed up. He wasn't in a suit. He was himself. Um, and so, 
you know, everything that you, you hear about and you see and you have exposure to there is accurate. Um, I was in a meeting one time um, with a legal team. We were talking about um, a relatively complex acquisition agreement um, and we were talking about some specific provisions within that agreement. And Steve happened to be walking past the conference room door. Door is glass. He looks in, sees some of his attorneys in there kind of, you know, uh, powwowing. And he just walks in as he was wont to do and walks in and says, what are you guys working on? And, you know, after we get done stammering a little bit, we're like, oh, we're this acquisition agreement. And here's kind of the thing that we're talking about. And it was really interesting. And this is the sort of telescopic versus microscopic capability that he had. He jumped in, immediately identified the issue, understood the issue that we were dealing with and suggested a couple of courses of action that some of us hadn't, hadn't even gotten to yet. And so he's not a lawyer, but that's how his mind works. And that's how brilliant he was. He was able to kind of step in at any phase of the game, at any aspect of his company and actually add significant value. That was pretty impressive. I mean, he walked out and we all went, man, we went to three years of law school for, <laughs> he just kind of took us to school. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, in terms of your time working with Steve, I know at one point you uh, were the guy in charge of setting up a specific acquisition yeah. for Apple. Yeah. And I know you guys had a pretty entertaining interaction or you kind of expected him to be really proud of something that you did in terms of oh, negotiating yeah. a certain deal. Oh yeah. Can you, can you talk us through that story as well? Yeah, actually it's one of the, it's actually one of, one of the things that, that caused me to transition out of being an attorney and really moving towards um, the finance side of the world. But the last company that uh, I facilitated acquisition um, by Apple was a company called Fingerworks. And Fingerworks was a uh, two Delaware University of Delaware professors um, that had written some really powerful code that founded uh, sort of multi-touch gesturing. And multi-touch gesturing is basically the grid that um, you you originally 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 started as two finger scrolling mm -hmm. right on your iPad, and that was sort of the the first toe in the water. But the patent portfolio formed the basis for everything that's touchscreen for Apple, and it and to this day, those patents have been iterated on, but if you go all the way back, the origin story was actually that company. And that was one of the few companies where, um, you know, I was, you know, told this is something that we have to get at all costs. And that had never really been, been uh, uttered before. I always had sort of a budget. There was always some, some price that we were willing to pay and some price that was too much. And this one was very clearly get this at all costs. And, um, at the end of the negotiations, uh, and I won't go into all of the specifics because we won't have time for that, but at the end of the negotiations, we bought that company for about $11 million. And, you know, it's in this, right? And everything that came after it and before it. And so um, I was really proud of that because, you know, with carte blanche, I could have spent a billion dollars on that company. And, you know, for $11 million, I was expecting a ticker tape parade, you know, maybe a cush corner mm -hmm. office, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and instead I kind of got a, a hearty clap on the back and I got, uh -huh. some, I got some shares and I got a nice bonus, you uh -huh. know, but at the end of the day, I was like, man, if, uh, there was some way for me to have been part of that, um, deal from an investment banking perspective, right. Um, the, the economics of that would have been substantially different for me. Um, and that was one of the things that made me start thinking, um, you know, maybe being an attorney isn't, you know, everything there is for me to do. So was that the final straw that caused you to leave Apple and start up 3Bell? I think it was, it was honestly a combination of that and the fact that I went to law school um, to help people. And going into law school, coming straight out of college more or less, I wasn't necessarily certain how I was going to help people, but I knew that I was going there to acquire a basis of knowledge that I could leverage on behalf of the, the people that were sitting across from me as my clients and I could help put them in a materially different and better position than they would be without me, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the tech boom hit and I got um, kind of pulled into uh, that world. I got pulled directly into Apple, which was a dream come true because I was a total Apple fanboy and frankly still am. Um, and so that was sort of a dream come true to work there. But after five years uh, and mostly working, you know, B2B where most of the interactions that I had were with other attorneys that worked for other companies, I had realized that I had drifted pretty far away from why I became a lawyer in the first place. 
which was to actually help uh, my clients and really help the people across from me. And I was missing that component in my life. And so, you know, I think it was a combination of those two things that led me, uh, you know, into the wealth management field. Was there anything that you really liked about Apple's culture strategies or philosophies that you were like, I need to build this into three bell as we grow? Yeah, absolutely. There were, there are two things that come to mind uh, top of mind. One is, um, just branding. Um, and the other is seeing around corners. <clears throat> and I'll start with the latter first, seeing around corners, because I think it's highly relevant to what we do on the private wealth management side, right? Um, our responsibility when we are managing portfolios, um, putting together estate plans, um, developing tax strategy across the board is to see around corners for our clients, right? What's gonna, what could potentially happen in your life? You know, that's gonna obviously cross over into insurance and how do we protect against that? What do we see happening with uh, the world economies and the capital markets and how do we navigate that? That requires a forward looking perspective, right? Um, you know, down to estate planning and tax planning, right? At a certain point in time, we're all gonna die. <laughs> how does that, you know, how do you prepare for that, right? And, uh, and what are the things that you can put into place to, you know, make that, um, that process um, as painless as possible, right? And all of those things go into wealth management. That all involves plotting a course forward and seeing around corners that your clients don't necessarily see or know exist, right? And so Steve and, and Apple, they were fantastic at doing that um, from a product perspective, right? Nobody knew that we wanted an iPad. And as a matter of fact, I thought it was the worst name ever. And uh -huh. when it came out, I was like, man, Apple finally invented something I'm not gonna have. Right, I've got three now. Right? <laughs> so uh, you know, Apple was really, really great about helping uh, to sort of define where that vision should go, um, and actually shaping um, its clients, right, which were the people that were buying its products and software. I felt the exact same way about Apple AirPods. I was right. like, this kind of looks weird, you know, right. Right. oddly futuristic, and now it's something I literally walk around with my pocket. All the time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, a funny story, uh, you know, kind of bringing things full circle. Uh, the guy who was Derek Zoolander uh -huh, was uh -huh. the product manager who launched uh, the uh, AirPods. No way. <laughs> yeah, which interesting is one of the most uh, successful pro uh, products that Apple's ever launched. Uh -huh. uh, and that's Eric Marshall. So, wow. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, anyways. <laughs> it still would have been. Look. Yeah, <laughs> one look. <laughs> It still would have been better to have him there when Steve came up because the costume made more sense. But, you know, at least he's got the AirPods. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Not a bad redemption there. No, no, not at all. Um, and it's got to be pretty satisfying to, you know, walk around and see, you know, people with your product uh, all over the place. I mean, for an engineer, there's no higher praise than ubiquitous adoption, right? I can only so, imagine. The other thing that you had asked about or uh, was... Um, you know, in terms of influence, right, would be, you know, just the, the, the perfectionist uh, mentality as it relates to everything that, you know, we do at 3Bell and then also, you know, the marketing and branding side. You can't come out of Apple without an appreciation for just how good they are at, um, you know, marketing their products and making you want to be part of, of that culture, right? Uh, it, Steve often defined it as being part of the Apple family. When you bought a product, you were part of the family. And interestingly enough, when we welcome a new client uh, into the firm, we are often um, welcoming them as a new member of the family, right? Um, and we actually put that into our welcome materials. Um, and I think that, um, you know, that strikes, um, a, a, you know, a resonance with the clients. Um, and it's a direct lineage uh, to Apple, and sort of that that sort of mentality, right? Um, I think if you go to look at you know, Three Bell's website, for example, and you look at it versus a lot of other financial advisory firms' websites, you're going to see a very big difference, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We're a dynamic team. Um, we work with dynamic entrepreneurs, um, business builders, executives that are out, you know, changing the world with the products and the services that they're providing. And, you know, our branding, I think, reflects that. And that, that definitely came from Apple. Um, Objectively, Three Bells experienced tremendous success over the last five years, mm -hmm. which, congratulations. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Are there any differentiators that you built into Three Bells offering to clients that you think really separates Three Bell from the rest of the wealth management 401k pack? Yeah, I think, 
you know, a lot of financial advisors are going to refer to themselves as wealth managers. And I think uh, most of the time they do that because it sounds cooler. <laughs> um, but in, in reality, wealth management means you're going well beyond uh, managing a portfolio of assets and you're putting together a comprehensive plan that covers everything that impacts a client financially. And that can be, it's certainly a portfolio, but it's also estate planning, tax strategy, right? Charitable planning, uh, everything down to, you know, what kind of entity should they be forming for their startup? How do our clients deal with equity compensation? It, it really is fairly holistic. Um, and we have a knowledge base and we have a process and we have systems that are specifically designed to address those issues for our clients and, and build it into a plan, right? So that's very, very unique. A lot of people say that they do it, but most actually don't, right? So I think one is just the comprehensive nature of the engagement that we have with our clients. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, as a result, we represent fewer clients. We have 220 families or so that we represent. Um, we have uh, six advisors on our staff. Um, all of the advisors work on all of the accounts collaboratively. That's also very unique. You get a brain trust, not a team of one that just happens to be under the same banner. So organizationally, I think that's very different. Um, that's very cool. And, and to stop you really quick, mm -hmm. I read something online where you're almost relating it to Jerry Maguire's yeah. strategy yeah. With, uh, it, with his clients. Yeah, no, I, yeah, exactly. Al although at this point in time, if I, if I make Jerry Maguire references, most of the millennials on my team don't have any <laughs> idea what I'm talking about. But uh, It's but a yeah. classic. Yeah, totally. And, and if you think about, you know, where Jerry Maguire's, uh, you know, firm started, it was with one client, right? And the, 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 the philosophy behind that was it was better to have fewer relationships, but deeper relationships, right? And so in the advisory world, um, you, you have to go one of two ways. You either have to try and be all things to a, a limited number of people, and that's the direction that we went, or you have to try and be a very small thing to as many people as you possibly can. And that's what you're gonna get with most wirehouse firms, not, not to pick on you know, any uh, individually, but it's gonna be the bigger banks that you, know, you might be more familiar with. Is there anything else that you think caused 3Bell to become so successful so quickly? Yeah, I think the other thing that I was, was gonna reference is really zeroing in on the portfolio side. And for, you know, since the 1930s, right, um, portfolios have been defined by stocks, stock market, or bonds, fixed income. And advisors have worked to try and figure out what mix of those two asset classes is most appropriate for their clients. And that's usually a combination of risk tolerance, right? Are you aggressive? Are you conservative? Or and or time horizon. How long do you have before you need to start drawing on these assets, right? And that's actually worked pretty darn well for an extended period of time. What's interesting is, is that um, if you look at the way endowments and sovereign wealth funds actually structure their portfolios, it looks vastly different than stocks and bonds. And what you'll see with Stanford, Harvard, Yale, these endowments that have outperformed significantly on an annualized basis over the same time period, what you'll see is that maybe only 10 to 25% of the assets are going to be in the stock market at any given time. The rest are going to be in what would be termed alternative investments. And they could be real estate, uh, they could be insurance policies, uh, they could be merger arbitrage, it could be currencies. Um, there are a variety of different investment strategies that sort of fall outside of the scope of either stocks or bonds. And what's really interesting is that um, the endowments have figured this out, right? And the, the results are clear. It's just a clearly superior way uh, to manage assets, which of course begs the question, well, then why doesn't everybody do it that way? And the problem is, is that you've got to have access. And so one of the things that 3Bell does that's very, very different is we democratize access to those types of uh, investments. So we're able to go out and replicate an endowment style portfolio, but for an individual family. And wow. that's very, very different. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. So I wanna bring up the next topic because mm -hmm. I'm very closely associated with cyber insurance mm -hmm. and 3Bell has got some unwanted attention from hackers in the past. Yeah. And That's a good way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> I would love if you could tell the story because we have lots of insurance brokers that are listening 
that could use this as a claims example yeah. when they're talking about cyber insurance. And then also if you could speak to the benefits of having a cyber insurance policy, because I know you've had to deal with the SEC on a couple things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd love if you could break that down. Yeah, sure. Well, let's start with the first uh, part of your question, which is, uh, you know, what what happened with respect to our unwanted attention. So, we got an email from our uh, banker, our private bankers at First Republic Bank. So, I'll give a shout out to them because they actually did an excellent job in catching this. Um, but they forwarded an email, and the email was requesting uh, a wire. And the wire was from a legitimate three bell bank account. It was an older one that had been zeroed out, but it was in fact a bank account uh, that belonged to the company. And it was requesting a transfer of about $40,000 uh, to pay for furniture. It was written very conversationally. Um, it, it referenced our, our banker by name. It was sent directly to our banker by name. And um, it referenced our Los Altos um, office location. And so this person knew an awful lot. It was a very targeted attack. And um, most interestingly, and maybe, maybe uh, the most scary aspect of this is this particular person had gone out and registered 3-bell.com with three L's for Bell. And so if you weren't really careful you could see John at 3-bell.com, which is my email address. And this supposedly came from me, except it had three L's. So if you really weren't looking, it looked a lot like it came from me. Mm -hmm. And when you went to the URL, it was actually registered through GoDaddy to someone. And so this person had gone through a lot of effort um, to make this look and feel legitimate. And fortunately, again, the risk management systems um, at First Republic caught it. And so they said, hey, this doesn't look legitimate to us. It's not from the right email address and we're just checking in here. Um, but it's, it actually scared the crap out of me. Um, and for the first time, it made me realize that we were under constant attack. This wasn't something that was happening once. It wasn't just a phishing email, which you know, for the most part are, are relatively easy to spot. Um, this was somebody that was you know, carrying out a calculated tactical attack. Um, and it made us realize that we, you know, we, one, we needed to start developing protocols and systems um, to, to deal with that, to train our employees, right, how to spot phishing emails. Um, we had to develop uh, even stronger protocols than is required by regulatory um, uh, oversight in order to ensure that certain types of requests were escalated. Um, and so it really changed our way of thinking. Um, and at the time we had a cyber policy, which we actually got through Evolve, thank you very much. Um, and so we were prepared, right? If that $40,000 had been wired out, it was gone. And we would have been filing a claim and we would have been fine, right? That $40,000 would have been recovered under the policy. Um, but it really opened our eyes to the fact that um, we as a firm had to develop um, a way of doing business that was calculated to prevent us from having to actually ever file that claim. And that was a different mindset, right? We couldn't just wait and file the claim. We needed to go on the offensive as opposed to the defensive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it sounds like you've been implementing risk management services beyond just the cyber insurance policy itself to help mitigate that risk, correct? Absolutely. Um, so we have, we have threat monitoring, so we have dark web monitoring um, that actually you know, came with our policy, which was really interesting. Um, we did a full threat assessment. Again, it was complementary um, with our policy. So we were actually able to go in, work with an, an IT professional, which is really what it takes. And he you know, essentially exposed all the different uh, vulnerabilities that we had. And some of them, we, you know, we would have never even thought um, to protect ourselves against it. It's just without being an IT professional, it's not your, you know, it's not your day-to-day uh, -day job. You're not going to know where those entry points are. And so it was, and it was really eye-opening and we addressed that. Um, and what's most interesting about that is um, the SEC is now really requiring that, right? So we had our last examination and examinations are, they're basically audits. 
uh, but they're done routinely. You always get an examination every, we'll I'll call it five to 10 years, right? Okay. The SEC is going to come in and say, hey, show me how you're doing all of these different things. And our last one was in 2017. No, I take that back. It was longer, about 2015. And at the time, they were only really concerned with whether or not your general liability insurance was sufficient to cover a potential cyber threat. Very interesting, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so they said, can you tell us, you know, you know, whether or not this is enough to, to deal with, you know, a wire fraud or et cetera, right? And it's very easy to say, yeah, it's, it, the, the, the coverage limit deals with it. But at the time, we actually had our policy already, our standalone cyber insurance policy. And so when we presented that to this, you know, panel of three folks that were the examiners that were in our office saying, hey, how are you protecting uh, yourselves against cyber insurance? It was um, almost novel to them and definitely impressive that we considered it enough of a threat that it needed its own standalone policy with just frankly better, better claims and better terms, right? That has shifted entirely now. So whereas before we were the kind of the pioneers in that respect, we were ahead of our times, between now and or between then and where we are right now, the SEC's number one concern is now cyber cyber threats, right? Every business needs a cyber insurance policy standalone. One hundred percent, right? And and if you if you don't think that that's the case, um, you either a don't understand the limits of your existing general liability insurance policy, or you're fooling yourself. Mm -hmm. you're, you're delusional. It's those are the only. So you're either ignorant or stupid. Mm -hmm. So go get a be a cyber insurance policy. <laughs> There's the plug. But I mean, it, it really is true. Um, and I can tell you that the SEC has now taken it one step farther. They are, they are into the camp now where they are requiring uh, independent firms like ours, registered investment advisors, to have systems protocols in place for testing threat assessment, right? For training your employees to not open phishing emails uh, remote wipe capabilities. I mean, they are keenly focused on cyber threats now. And it makes sense because if you think about the level of confidential information that a wealth management firm controls and the amount of damage that can stem from it, right? Like our, our firm manages over $2 billion in capital. Well, there's a lot of damage that can be done there, right? And so the SEC is now very, very, very keyed in on making sure that those firms are doing everything that they can possibly do to proactively make sure that there aren't any successful th cyber threats, um, not just insuring against it anymore. Very interesting transition. Can you describe the massage parlor hacking attack? <laughs> yeah, so uh, if you go to uh, 3bell.com, not no dash, it's, a, it's actually an Asian massage parlor. <laughs> So, yeah, we've been trying to buy that one for a while. They're uh -huh. they're holding out, uh -huh. um, but uh, yeah, I mean the they <laughs> there was a there was a cyber attack um, on the Asian massage parlor where they actually tried to sh shut them down, um, thinking that it was three dash bell dot com, which is a wealth management firm. I didn't get the specifics behind how successful they were in shutting down their online scheduling operation for, for the massages, but <laughs> again, it's one more example of uh, of the fact that those threats are are ever present, right? Mm -hmm. If you're not seeing them, it doesn't mean that they're not happening. Yep, I want to talk about Three Bell's intersection with the insurance industry mm -hmm. because I know Three Bell provides significant value mm -hmm. to independent agencies across the U.S. And I know you're an excellent referral partner for a lot of these agencies. Yeah. Is there a way you can break down Three Bell's value proposition specifically for insurance agency partners? Yeah, for sure. Um, so Three Bell has uh, two cylinders in the same engine. Uh, one's private wealth management um, and the other is 401k corporate retirement plans. Um, and interestingly, those complement what are the two cylinders in most um, agency engines, and that is personal lines, and commercial lines, right? And so on the personal line side, right, you're looking at insuring, you know, homes, artwork, um, umbrella policies, right? It's sort of everything around bulletproofing that family. And that's absolutely part of our process, right? And that's going back to what's the difference between wealth management 
in financial advisory work, right? A wealth manager is looking for those curveballs that life throws you and is insuring against that, right? And that actually many times requires, you know, the right policies. Mm -hmm. um, and so on the personal line side, if agencies have um, clients where, you know, they're working with them in an insurance capacity and they are asking whether or not there might be a better wealth manager for them out there, someone that views things more comprehensively, maybe someone that uh, takes that sort of endowment style approach and just has flat out better investment options uh, available, then we're going to be able to come in and complement what the brokers are doing on the insurance side uh, on the wealth management side and, and reinforce those relationships and bulletproof them and make sure that there's no other brokers that are coming in and trying to take those relationships on the personal line side. And those are really simpatico. They just go hand in hand. Um, I would consider insurance or risk management one of the four pillars of wealth management. So it's, it's part of our process. It's part of our DNA. The other cylinder in the engine is on the commercial side. And most firms aren't going to do both. Matter of fact, very, very, very few do both and almost none do both well. <laughs> so um, on the 401k side, that really syncs up with the commercial lines, right? And so agencies are going to be working with companies and they're going to be insuring them against workers' comp, right? Things of that nature. Um, and when you are working with a company, most of the times we have found most agencies don't have a 401k department. Or if they do, it's a small nascent department and they're not all that confident in handing over some of their most important relationships on the insurance side for fear of the 401k side not necessarily um, keeping up. And so on the 401k side, uh, we have about 180 different 401k plans. We work with about 60 different service providers. Um, and within that spectrum, um, we are providing full fiduciary services um, and have a full complement of, um, of portfolio management. Uh, we're working with the 401k committees, et cetera, of these companies. And the way that that relates over to the brokerage world, right, the insurance brokerage world, is that at the end of the day, we're bulletproofing and we're shoring up an access point for their clients, right? And so I can tell you that if you are a broker and you have all of the commercial lines business for a particular company, but you don't have the benefits side and you don't have the 401k side, there are two access points into your insurance and they're deadly. I've seen people uh, get Trojan horsed many times. And so the more of those you can shore up with uh, allies and people that are gonna reinforce what you're doing, uh, the more you're gonna bulletproof your book. And so it's, it's very interesting how our firm uh, works hand in hand with um, with brokerage uh, agencies um, based on those two cylinders, right? Personal and commercial. If I was an insurance agency in the US, or if I was a broker working for one of those agencies and mm -hmm. I wanted to set up a referral relationship with 3Bell, mm -hmm. how would I go about doing that? Probably reach out to me directly. Um, and you, that's not 3Bell.com because you'll get the Asian massage parlor. <laughs> <laughs> three dash Well, bell. I don't know. It depends on what you want, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah, three, T-H-R-E-E dash B-E-L-L. -L. I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's J-O-N. It's J-O-N. Yeah, and I'm easy to find on our website too. But uh, that we have several of those types of relationships and they work extremely well. And basically what we do is we shut up, set up a revenue share. And so for every client that's referred over that becomes either a private wealth management client or a 401k client, um, we will set up a revenue share so that the referring broker can actually share in some of the economics of that. So it's not just about bulletproofing, it's uh, about adding an accretive revenue stream. We will include that contact information on the webpage okay. as well for this episode so that people can access it that are listening to this. Great, appreciate that. Yeah, 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 no problem. Um, so I want to shift gears a little bit to 401k plans because yeah. if I was an insurance broker listening to this mm -hmm. and I wanted to know how to maximize the benefits that I'm getting from my 401k plan, is there any just high level advice that you give to anyone that was um, looking to contribute to their 401k in the most effective way? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a number of different ways to optimize um, a 401k plan. Um, and very similar to, um, I think the insurance industry there are different uh, carriers that are going to be stronger um, for different types of situations and different types of plans, right? 
Um, so on the personal line side, just to use an example, you might go out um, with a, one set of underwriting data, right, for a life insurance policy, and you might get 12 quotes from carriers, and one of them might be preferred best, and the other one might be uninsurable. Same information, right? And, you know, yes, so well, how do you reconcile that, right? And you reconcile that because one of those carriers wants that type of business more so than the other one. And the same, the same dynamic actually occurs for 401k plans, right? So there are going to be carriers uh, and providers, um, and I'm talking about, you know, like the ones you'd be familiar with would be like Empower, Fidelity, right? These are, these are called record keepers or carriers. They're basically the portal that you're logging into, right, as a participant to make your trades and allocations. So there are right-sized um, carriers for each type of um, company. Right. So what's right for Apple might not be what's right for Three Bell or Evolve. And so number one, you need to have an advisor that's sort of helping you to right size that, can negotiate pricing intelligently on your behalf, and then obviously provide all of the fiduciary support um, for the investment committee and then the education support um, for the participants so that they can understand what tools they have available to them. Um, and I think that's, you'd be surprised how many uh, 401k plans fail at just those um, initial sort of table stakes aspects. Um, we do that extremely well. Um, we also do enough business with a lot of these carriers that we have negotiated pricing that's below um, what you might be able to get uh, off the shelf sort of as the rack rate. Um, wow, so cool. It's not uncommon for us to come on board as an advisor, which does it does have a cost associated with it, right? Um, but it's not uncommon for us to be able to come on board as the advisor and actually lower the fees associated with the platform enough to pay for ourselves. Um, it doesn't always work out that way, but it's not uncommon at all. Um, I think for agencies, right? Um, we actually work with a number of, of agencies themselves managing their 401k plan. And one of the things that we see most often is that you'll have an agency where you have a, a, a lot of high producing individuals, and then you might have some operations staff, and those operations staff, um, they really desperately need a, a 401k. Um, they need someone to help them plan for retirement, and they need to make it an automated, systematic, automated systematic um, platform that encourages them to do what most people don't like to do um, out of the gate, which is safe for retirement, right? Most people like to spend. Makes a lot of sense. I'm, I like to spend too, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but where we often see the ability to supplement for those agencies is with a self-funded pension. And that's often referred to as a cash balance plan. Um, but what it is is it basically takes you know, the 50 or so thousand that you can put into a 401k profit sharing plan, right, per, per participant. And it increases that by, it can be up to 200 to $250,000 per year. Wow. And those are big numbers, right? And that applies to every person within an agency, every employee? Well, what's interesting is, is that whereas a 401k plan has to be applied equally across the board, so if you give them a 3% match, you've got to give it equally to everyone. What you can do with a, um, an executive pension is you can actually give that extra $150,000 or $200,000 benefit to the individuals that need it the most. And so that's not to say that you're doing the operations team a disservice. It's just that they are probably not in the same compensation range where they actually are getting crushed in taxes and need to put more away pre-tax. They need more education. They need to understand, um, you know, the longevity of how to invest for the long haul, right? Whereas your producers are probably looking at this going, man, I've maxed out my 401k, I've maxed out my profit sharing plan, I'm still getting killed. And if I could put another 50 or 100 or 150 or $200,000 away per year, it would really move the needle in terms of building up my uh, retirement plan and it would also save me a bunch of taxes up front. And so a lot of times we're coming in and educating for the first time uh, brokerage firms and agencies that just didn't know that that existed. This is huge for agency owners to know about. 100%. Um, and the ability to tactically allocate um, that, those extra contributions to the people that need it is, is, is key. Very cool. I really appreciate you breaking that yeah. down because like I said, there's no doubt that 3Bell can provide a significant amount of value to insurance brokers yeah. across the country. 
can you tell us a story where you collaborated with uh, a producer in the insurance industry and you guys just made a client's experience as phenomenal as it can possibly be, like a huge win that you guys celebrated alongside an insurance agent? Oh, yeah. Um, so I will tell you the most, uh, the most poignant story was um, one, of my, one of my best friends um, lives up in San Carlos, um, which if you're not familiar with, with uh, that particular area here in the Bay Area, it's kind of up into the hills, right? And he had a really steep driveway. And the, the driveway kind of wound around and his house sort of sat at the top of the hill. And there were some really bad storms um, and flooding that occurred, I was gonna say five years ago, but it's probably about seven years ago now here in California. And it caused a lot of landslides. Um, some of the Victorian houses um, you know, were lost in San Francisco to the landslides. Um, and his, um, his driveway washed out and it washed completely out. And so he couldn't get into or out of his house, right? And so he called his insurance agency and um, at the time he was with, uh, oh, I know who he was with, but I won't say it. <laughs> but he called uh, his, he didn't have someone that had been representing him. And he called his, uh, he called the insurance company directly as opposed to his broker and said, hey, this is what happened. And they said, mm, well, that is flood damage, uh, not wind damage and it was a it was a, a tree that had been knocked over by wind that pulled the driveway out you know from under and of course there was it was a lot of water too but it was the wind knocking the tree over that caused the driveway to wash out so basically the insurance company came back and said hey we're not going to cover this i'm sorry this is on you this is flood damage and you're not in a flood plane so you can't get flood damage even if you wanted flood coverage even if you wanted it and He's like, oh, okay, that sucks. Uh, and then went out and got an estimate. And the engineering specifications for reshoring up that, um, that hillside were going to cost him about $180,000 because he had to basically rebuild it in such a way that it met current uh, county code. And that meant building up a bulwark um, and, and, in, and basically having a structural engineer come out. Um, anyway, it's about $180,000 uh, price tag on that. And that's not an insignificant amount of money just to be able to get into your house. And remember the driveway was washed out in a way that he couldn't get into or out of his house. So he's, he's got to fix this. Right. And it's interesting because I called, um, one of the personal lines brokers that we, um, refer a lot of business to back and forth. And I, I called in a favor because I knew that this particular, uh, broker did a lot of work with this carrier had a huge book with this carrier. Um, and I reached out to him and gave, gave him the situation. He put a call into um, that carrier and said, this person is, was just in the process of moving all of their accounts over to me. Um, and I want you to cover this. And solely because of the relationship that that broker had with that carrier, the insurance carrier turned around and covered 100% of the $180,000 required to rebuild that guy's. That's amazing. Yeah. And that to me, that actually changed my perspective on how critical it was to have an advocate in the insurance process. Right? That, that is a prime example of the relationship business at work. No question. Um, and, you know, it, it's interesting. You, you could go and get, you know, a bargain basement, you know, pricing. Mm -hmm. But without a broker that controls enough of a book of business to have leverage in a situation where otherwise as the insured you have zero and not only do you have zero leverage but your interests are diametrically opposed to those of the insurance company the second you file a claim right they have every reason to not pay you you have every reason to want them to pay right and so you're you're lost without an intermediary that can navigate that for you that has the leverage to kind of reconcile that Mm -hmm. Right, and that's where brokers come in. And like I said, that one story, that one experience, completely redefined um, the value that I placed on having a broker um, in that in that situation. Yeah. What's next for Three Bell Capital? Well, um, you know, we've built a phenomenal firm. We've got a great team. Um, the last year has been eye opening. 
right? I mean, since February, we have been working in a completely distributed um, environment, right? Everyone has, has been working from home since really February. And we haven't missed a beat. And so that's actually been very interesting for us because we're able to look at the systems that we're using and the personnel and understand that we can do this from anywhere. Um, and our systems are hands down some of the best systems that you can get. Everything is now cloud-based. And so what that means for us is that we can actually start to, to attract some other great producers, right? And we can not only grow organically by adding new clients, but we can add great team members as well. And so I think what you're gonna see over the next few years is we're going to start carefully, um, I wouldn't say recruiting, but I think we're gonna be in a, just a very good position to add great team members who are just tired of not having any fun doing what they're doing anymore. And again, I'll pick on the big banks because they make it not very fun. I was at Smith Barney, which was later Morgan Stanley. I, I under, understand how that works, right? And I think we can offer something to, um, to folks that are great advisors and just looking for a great firm uh, to do their business. Cool. Sounds good. Yeah. Well, John, I can't thank you enough for coming on. Yeah. It's been a pleasure chatting with you today, yeah. as always. Yeah. Um, would love to do it again Anytime. as well. And uh, yeah, man, appreciate you coming on the podcast. Look forward to connecting in soon. Anytime. Um, happy to help. And if anybody has any questions about anything that we talked about or wants to connect, I am hands down available. So um, appreciate all the brokers out there. Um, it's kind of a thankless job sometimes, you know, but everything that you guys do makes a huge difference in the lives of our clients. And, you know, you probably don't get thanked for that much, very much or as much as you should. So I want you to know that uh, we, we definitely appreciate it. Thanks, John. You bet.